from the beginning of Who Fears Death. This is my, my third novel. And um, this is a more solemn excerpt, but I think it's a prime example of what I'm talking about. And I'll explain everything once I, once I read this. It's pretty short, it takes about seven minutes. And um, once I explain everything about this piece, this is, this is the first part of this, the book that I wrote, of, of, um, of Who Fears Death. This was the first thing that I, that I wrote in the book. And when I wrote it, I had no idea what I was writing. I just was writing. But I'll explain that in a second, so let me read it first. This is an illustration from um, the German edition of Who Fears Death, and this is what my character looks like. Um, it's a, an illustrator named Greg Ruth just rendered her perfectly. We talked for a long time about what she looked like, and then he drew her. Oddly enough, she looks a lot like Erica Badu. <laughs> okay, um, Who Fears Death? Chapter one, The Face of My Father. My life fell apart when I was 16. Papa died. He had such a strong heart, yet he died. Was it the heat and smoke from his blacksmithing shop? It's true that nothing could take him from his work, his art. He loved to make the metal bend and obey him, but his work only seemed to strengthen him. He was so happy in his shop. So what was it that killed him? To this day, I can't be sure. I hope it had nothing to do with me or what I did back then. Immediately after he died, my mother came running out of their bedroom, sobbing and throwing herself against the wall. I knew then that I would be different. I knew in that moment that I would never again be able to control the fire inside me. I, beta I became a different creature that day, not so human. Everything that happened later I now understand started then. The ceremony was held outside in the middle of the day. It was already terribly hot. His body lay on thick white cloth surrounded by a garland of braided palm fronds. I knelt there in the sand before his body saying my last goodbye. I'll never forget his face. It didn't look like Papa's anymore. Papa's skin was dark brown, his lips were full. His face had sunken cheeks, deflated lips, and skin like gray-brown paper. Papa's spirit had gone elsewhere. The back of my neck prickled. My white veil was a poor protection from people's ignorant and fearful eyes. By this time, everyone was always watching me. I clenched my jaw. Around me, women were on their knees, weeping and wailing. Papa was dearly loved, despite the fact that he'd married my mother, a woman with a daughter like me, an Ewu daughter. That had long been, excu that had long been excused as one of those mistakes even the greatest man can make. Over the wailing, I heard my mother's soft whimper. She had suffered the greatest loss. And now it was her turn to have her last moment. Afterwards, they'd take him for cremation. I looked down at his face one last time. I'll never see you again, I thought. I wasn't ready. I blinked and touched my chest. That's when it happened, when I touched my chest. At first, it felt like an itchy tingle. It quickly swelled into something more. The more I tried to get up, the more intense it grew, and the more my grief expanded. They can't take him, I thought, frantically. There's still so much metal left in his shop. He hasn't finished his work. The sensation spread through my chest and radiated out of the rest of my body. I rounded my shoulders to hold it in. Then I started pulling it from people around me. I shuddered and gnashed my teeth. I was filling with rage. Oh, not here, I thought, not at Papa's ceremony. Life wouldn't leave me alone long enough to even mourn my dead father. Behind me, the wailing stopped. All I heard was a gentle breeze. It was utterly eerie. Something was below my feet, in the ground or maybe somewhere else. Suddenly, I was slammed with the pained emotions of everyone around me for Papa. On instinct, I laid my hand on his arm. People started screaming. I didn't turn around, I was too focused on what I had to do. Nobody tried to pull me away, no one touched me. My friend Lu Yu's uncle was once struck by a lightning during a rare Ungwa season storm. He survived, but he couldn't stop talking about how it felt like being violently shaken from the inside out. That's how I felt now. I gasped with horror, I couldn't take my hand from Papa's arm, 
It was fused to him. My sand-colored skin tapered to his gray-brown skin from my palm, a mound of mingled flesh. I started screaming. It caught in my throat and I coughed and then I stared. Papa's chest was slowly moving up and down, up and down. He was breathing. I was both repulsed and desperately hopeful. I took a deep breath and cried, live, Papa, live. A pair of hands settled on my wrists. I knew exactly whose they were. One of his fingers was broken and bandaged and if he didn't get his hands off me, I'd hurt him far worse than I had five days prior. Oni Songu, Aro said into my ear, quickly taking his hands from my wrists. Oh, how I hated him. But I listened. He's gone, he said. Let go so we can all be free of it. Somehow I did. I let go of Papa. Everything went dead silent again, as if the world for a moment were submerged in water. Then the power that was built up inside me burst. My veil was blown off of my head and my, my freed braids whipped back. Everyone and everything was thrown back. Aro, my mother, family, friends, acquaintances, strangers, the table of food, the 50 yams, the 13 large monkey bread fruits, the five cows, the 10 goats, the 30 hens, and so much sand. Back in town, the power went off for 30 seconds. Houses would need to be swept of sand and the computers would be taken in for dust damage that underwater-like silence again. I looked down at my hand. When I tried to remove it from Papa's still cold, dead arm, there was a sound of peeling like weak glue flaking off. My hand left a silhouette of dried mucus on Papa's arm. I rubbed my fingers together. More of the stuff crackled and peeled from between them. I took one look at Papa. Then I fell over to the side and passed out. That was four years ago. Now see me. People here know that I caused it all. They want to see my blood, they want to see me suffer, and then they want to kill me. Whatever happens after this, let me stop. Tonight you want to know how I came to be what I am. You want to know how I got here. It's a long story, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you. You're a fool if you believe what others say about me. I tell you my story to avert all those lies. Thankfully, even my long story will fit on that laptop of yours. I have two days. I hope it's enough time. It will all catch up with me soon. My mother named me Onye Songwu. It means who fears death. She named me well. I was born 20 years ago during troubled times. Ironically, I grew up far from all the killing. So that's the beginning of who fears death. And this is a post-apocalyptic novel set in the future Sudan about a girl who becomes a powerful sorceress. Um, that's a very bad summary <laughs> of a very complex book. And, this beginning, and in this beginning, it's a moment about a girl who is somewhat of a pariah in her community who nearly brings her, father, her father's body back to life. Who Fears Death? Probably, of all of, the, of all of my novels, I think I've written 11. Who Fears Death, out of all of them, took me the longest and took the most from me. Um, it was initially 700 pages, and then I got it down to 389 without changing any of the plot. That's a, that's a whole other discussion for a writing class. <laughs> my agent actually taught me what, I did, what to do, and I did it, and it took me two years. But um, when I started writing Who Fears Death, I wrote it... The reason, the, the specific reason I started writing this story was because my father passed. And um, the, that beginning, that beginning over the years moved to the end, to the middle, to somewhere closer near the end, and then finally it went back to the beginning. It was the first thing I wrote from Who Fears Death. And um, it's based on, and when I wrote it, I had no idea what I was writing. I didn't know who this girl was. I didn't know any of it. All I know is at the time I was in great pain and I needed to get the pain out. So um, my father had passed from, a, he was a cardiovascular surgeon. He was a heart surgeon. My family's very close and he had, um, he had Parkinson's and congestive heart failure. So I was very angry. So Parkinson's makes you shake. He was a surgeon. So that's for a surgeon to have that, it's not, not a pretty thing. And then also, you know, congestive heart failure. That was what he 
spent his life, um, he spent his life saving people's hearts and that's what took him. So I was extremely angry and, um, and he, we had his wake keeping in Chicago and then he was buried in Nigeria. And uh, during his wake keeping, for some reason I found myself in the room with his body after everything, after everyone had left. And I remember looking down, I remember looking down at his face and it just didn't look like him anymore and I knew he was gone. And um, as I was looking down, I just remember this something was building inside me, it was rage, it was, it was, it was destructive and it felt like something that would destroy that whole building that we were in. And I remember my mom coming in there, my mom and my sister coming in there and dragging me out of there. And that night was when I wrote this. Um, and I had no idea what it was. I had no idea who this character was, but I was just pouring it in there. So this idea of her, uh, most this, this whole part is basically autobiographical until you know, until the supernatural element comes in. And that supernatural element is derived from just wishful thinking, I guess you could say. But as, and then as I wrote the book, and I tend to be a very nonlinear writer, I would just write from, I would just sit down and start. I don't do outlines very well at all. I just sit down and start, and then what comes, comes. And so this is what came. And so that's, so for a, a book that is, I guess it would be considered either well, some call it science fiction, some call it fantasy, some call it magical realism. I don't know what it is. It is what it is. Um, but the, the realism that, that the, the story began with was important. And then there's realism woven throughout the, woven throughout the story. 